Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 16th annual scientific meeting of the Cardiorenal Forum. Uh, this year, we're having a hybrid meeting. Uh, we've got a panel uh, within a studio in London, and obviously your, yourselves uh, tuning in. We really hope that next year uh, we'll be able to have this as a face-to-face -face meeting. We've got 600 uh, delegates uh, uh, lined up to join today, and a really important thing is to keep this meeting interactive. Um, and that really uh, is what brings the best out, out of it, I think. It's, uh, it's practical considerations of how to manage cardiorenal disease um, and also patients with diabetes. We're really grateful for all of our sponsors that have helped uh, enable us to put this independent meeting on free of charge. Um, so thank you very much to you all. And I, I'd like to introduce uh, colleagues joining me in the studio today. So first of all, we have Smita Sinner, consultant nephrologist, uh, from Salford Royal NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, welcome, Smita. We've got uh, Sarah Burkholzer, cardiology uh, registrar, working at, at Portsmouth uh, NHS University Hospitals Trust. And we've got my brother, Phil Cowra, uh, professor of renal medicine in Manchester, and one of the co-founders of the Cardio Renal Forum with myself and uh, Dr. Henry Purcell. We've got more experts from around the country, cardiology, heart failure, nephrology, diabetes, Hematology anticoagulation will be streamed in through throughout the day. As I've already mentioned, it's really important to try and keep this uh, as interactive as, as possible, and we'd be grateful for you submitting your questions, and you can do that by the form underneath the viewing window. Uh, we want to hear from you and uh, and highlight uh, particularly clinical um, clinical issues, um, and, and we can all learn from discussing clinical questions and cases. So let's start our first session, um, understanding the evidence base of diabetes drugs in heart failure and chronic kidney disease. And I'm delighted uh, to open this session. And the first uh, presenter today is going to be uh, Dr. Rosita Zakiri, who's a consultant cardiologist uh, across uh, London at King's College Hospital. Uh, welcome, Rosita. Good morning, I'm Rosita Zachary from King's College London and I'm delighted to be with you this morning to discuss SGLT2 inhibitors and the facts supporting their use in patients with heart failure. I have no disclosures. So SGLT2 inhibitors are a class of drugs that were initially approved to treat type 2 diabetes. As the name suggests, they target the SGLT2 co-transporter which is found in the proximal renal tubule and reabsorbs about 90% of filtered glucose. So SGLT2 inhibitors prevent the kidneys from reabsorbing glucose, which is eliminated in the urine and leads to a lower plasma glucose. Now in cardiology, these drugs first came to our attention after several cardiovascular outcomes trials in patients with type 2 diabetes showed a substantial reduction in heart failure hospitalization, which seemed to be a class effect. Since then, there have been several clinical trials of SGLT2 inhibitors in the management of heart failure, ranging from prevention to treatment, and I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list, but two trials that have been practice changing in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction were DAPA-HF, and the emperor reduced trials. Now, these were two large trials in ambulatory adult patients with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Patients were randomized to receive dapagliflozin or empagliflozin, respectively, versus placebo. The patient characteristics were similar to those that we would typically see in a heart failure clinic, with the exception, perhaps, that less than one in four patients were female but they did enroll patients with and without diabetes and across the spectrum of renal function. And these are the primary composite endpoints for both trials, which were similar. As you can see that there was a significant reduction in the risk of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization compared with placebo, with a relative risk reduction of 26% in DAPA-HF and 25% in emperor reduced. If you look at the graphs more closely, we can see that the onset of benefit, which is when the curves start to separate, happened very early, within 28 days or so. And the overall benefit was similar in patients with and without diabetes, with a small number needed to treat. 
Now, importantly, these benefits were on top of standard heart failure therapy. So in this meta-analysis, where they combined the data from DAPA-HF and Emperor reduced we can see that even patients who were receiving Secubitrol Valsartan, which is the latest addition to standard heart failure therapy, they still had a substantial benefit. So SGLT2 inhibitors provide incremental benefit on top of existing optimal heart failure care. Now, when you start these drugs, there is an initial drop in EGFR in the order of one to two mils per minute magnitude, which is small and seems to recover, at least partially. But over time, both trials showed a consistent lower rate of decline of EGFR over time uh, versus placebo and a reduction in the rate of renal adverse events. So compared to some of the other drugs that we have in heart failure, the SGLT2 inhibitors are quite renal friendly. I don't have time to present all the results from these trials, but there was also a signal of benefit in terms of improved quality of life scores and slowed progression of NYHA class, which is also a very important goal of heart failure therapy. So what is the mechanism of cardioprotection of SGLT2 inhibition? Well, this is a hotly debated topic. Now, among the candidates that are being discussed, we know firstly that sodium and glucose are co-transported. So SGLT2 inhibitors, um, at least initially, cause an increase in sodium excretion or natiuresis, and alongside glycosuria, this leads to an osmotic diuresis. And both in DAPA-HF and in Emperor Reduce, they noticed that patients had an increase in hematocrit. But this increase peaked around four months. And if this is truly just a diuretic effect, you'd expect that to be earlier. So another hypothesis is that this might be related to erythropoietin, which has additional beneficial effects on cardiorenal health. There are also experimental data showing that there's reduced cardiac inflammation altered cardiac bioenergetics, inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system, and of course, an improvement in renal function can have profound hemodynamic and non-hemodynamic benefits on cardiac function. Some people say that SGLT2 inhibitors are just diuretics. That's probably an oversimplistic explanation. And we know that other loop and thiazide diuretics don't have a, a similar effect on mortality. Other mechanisms that probably don't have a major role in cardioprotection are glucose, blood pressure, and weight reduction. Now, these are important pharmacological effects of SGLT2 inhibitors, but quite small. And especially for the minimal effect on blood pressure, you would effect, expect that this to take several years rather than weeks to have an impact on major adverse cardiac events. The jury is also out in terms of altered ketone oxidation and atherosclerotic plaque regression. So this is an area of active research. Where does this leave us in terms of clinical practice? Well, the latest European Society of Cardiology guidelines have given SGLT2 inhibitors a class 1A level of recommendation, which is the highest level of recommendation. And they've also moved away from a stepwise approach to heart failure therapy and now advocate using all four classes of drugs that reduce mortality in patients with heart failure at the same level of priority, including SGLT2 inhibitors, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. So there's no longer a recommendation for you to prescribe these agents in a specific order just to get all four agents on board as soon as you can. There are still some differences in local regulatory approval. So in Europe, empagliflozin has been approved for the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction based on the emperor reduced trial for patients with an EGFR down to 20 mils per minute. In the UK, NICE released guidance in February authorizing the use of dapagliflozin for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but still as an add-on therapy to optimal care with an ACE or an ARNI beta blocker and MRA, and on the advice of a heart failure specialist. Is there anyone who should not be given an SGLT2 inhibitor? Well, because of the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis, 
patients with type 1 diabetes and previous ketoacidosis should not be given these drugs. And it would also add a serious portion for patients with type 2 diabetes on insulin. Remember that ketoacidosis can occur without an elevation in plasma glucose, so it's important to check for ketones in any acute illness. Also, because we don't have safety information yet, these drugs are not approved for patients who are on dialysis or pregnant or breastfeeding women, and we should not be given to patients who've shown a serious allergy. As a cardiologist, we are confident to use um, these drugs uh, to an EGFR of 30 mL per minute for dapagliflozin and 20 mL per minute of empagliflozin, but below that would need specialist renal advice. And there is also an increased risk of genital fungal infections, which patients should be counseled about, and emphasize the importance of maintaining personal hygiene and detecting and treating genital infections early, as well as seeking medical advice and temporarily stopping these agents if they develop an acute serious illness. So finally, what about inpatients? Well, the um, Soloist Worsening Heart Failure Trial looked at this question. They enrolled patients with type 2 diabetes and acute heart failure and randomized them to sotagliflozin, which is an SGLT1 and 2 inhibitor, versus placebo. It was a smaller trial than DAPHF or EMPA reduced, mainly because it was terminated early, but it also showed a substantial reduction, possibly even greater reduction, in their primary outcome of total cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalizations and urgent heart failure visits over a median follow-up of nine months. There's no reason to believe that these results are not applicable to patients with acute heart failure without diabetes, but there are ongoing studies looking at these questions. So in summary, SGLT2 inhibitors now have a class 1A indication for use in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction based on two large consistent clinical trials using dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. We're confident to use them down to an EGFR of 20 mLs per minute, and they should be used alongside existing core heart failure with reduced ejection fraction therapies. They have shown convincing survival and cardiovascular and renal benefits, and serious adverse events are rare, but remember that ketoacidosis can be used with glycemic. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Rosita, for such an excellent overview. Um, Rosita will be back for Q&As once we've heard from our next two, two speakers, so we'll take that as a panel. Uh, so we're now going to move across to SGLT2 inhibitors in CKD. Uh, over to you, Smita. Thanks, Paul. Um, so Rosita has very kindly done a lot of the, uh, the hard work describing the mechanisms of action of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, so I'll try not to cover that. Um, so those are my disclosures. Um, so as a nephrologist, I work with patients who are on dialysis. We like to think that we look after patients on the left-hand side. So this is Delia. She's been 35 years on dialysis and she's still smiling. Um, but the reality is we have a lot of patients who are more in keeping with the, with the other side. Um, patients who are a bit older, have diabetes, um, but also have complications such as retinopathy, heart failure and, and amputation. Um, and so it's not a great quality of life with um, significant times spent in hospital um, and ultimately what we want to do is avoid that um, but the reality is that we're going to see more of these patients. Um, CKD prevalence um, or the detection of it is variable. You can see the heat map on the right hand side depending on where you live. Um, that's how likely you are to have your CKD diagnosed. Um, it's associated with an aging population so we know that we're going to see more of it uh, and despite having tools to detect it we're just not very good. Um, so we, blood tests we're not too bad at but the, uh, the urines were absolutely atrocious at doing urine ACRs. So not only do we have a growing problem, we have a problem with detection. Um, this is um, just a quick CKD pathway side. I won't go into too much detail, but um, we want to stop people progressing down this pathway. And we do have therapies um, that, can, that can help, although not very many. Um, largely, we focus on blood pressure control. Nephrologists were absolutely obsessed with blood pressure. Um, and this is data that's uh, from 1998, um, and it shows that if you control the blood pressure tightly, then um, your kidney function um, won't decline as quickly as it would if you don't. 
The other thing we've done for the last 20 years is use renin angiotensin system inhibitors. And again, this is 20 year old data. Uh, two trials, IDNT and renal, show that if you get patients on these drugs, then you can um, reduce the risk of progression to end stage kidney disease. And that is pretty much where we've been since the 2000s, early 2000s. We have tried uh, desperately to look for other medications to try and attenuate that risk, but have got absolutely nowhere until um, this class of drug. So Rosita's told you how it works, but from a kidney point of view, we got excited about it because of the effect it has on the glomerulus and intraglomerular pressure. Uh, so if you recall your um, um, renal physiology, you have an afferent arteriole that takes blood into the glomerulus and an efferent arteriole that takes blood out. And that largely regulates the intraglomerular pressure. SGLT2 inhibitors cause afferent arteriole vasoconstriction. So if you vasoconstrict the afferent arteriole, you've got less blood going in, so you reduce the pressure. Renin angiotensin system inhibitors, they cause efferent arterial vasodilation. So that widens the exit of blood, so you get less blood in the glomerulus again. So you can see why these two effects were attractive to, to nephrologists and they might have complementary effects on intraglomerular pressure and subsequently progression of kidney disease. So that's where the excitement started. Um, and now we've had two landmark trials um, that really um, have changed our view on how we should be managing patients with kidney disease. So this was the first one. This came out, this was published <coughs> in 2019. Um, and it's called Credence, and over 4,000 patients, so nephrology not notorious for its large trials, we're a bit behind the cardiologists on that front, but this has been a good effort on our part. Um, so over 4,000 patients um, with reasonably controlled diabetes, and they got Canagaflows in 100, which isn't the, the, the top dose for diabetes, and placebo. Primary endpoint was end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, renal or cardiovascular death. Um, and there were some important um, secondary endpoints there. Um, the thing to note is that these weren't badly managed diabetic patients. 99.9% um, .9 were already on an ACE or an ARB. Blood pressure, not too bad. We'd like it lower, but not too bad. Diabetes, reasonably controlled, and they were on a statin. And here is the, the slide that's, that, that changed things for the nephrology community. Um, it absolutely met its primary endpoint um, and it met it, met it early. Uh, there was a 30% risk reduction in the primary outcome. And I think when it was presented in Melbourne, a job lot of nephrologists stood up and clapped. I could say that's a reflection on how sad we are, uh, but also perhaps how long we've waited for a positive clinical trial. Um, so this was a, a, a game changer um, and it absolutely hit all the other the things as well. And it, the other thing to note, it was stopped early due to benefits. So um, that, that's how impressive the, the trial data was. Um, so if you look at the forest plot, um, all sits to the left, end stage kidney disease, renal death, um, cardiovascular death, so, and the primary endpoint is at the bottom. Um, if you do sub-analyses, and again, I won't spend too long going into it, some people say, oh, well, it only works in people with um, kidney function that's preserved. You saw Rosita's data from um, the heart failure trials. Those were patients with reasonably preserved renal function. But if you look here, um, you know, the effect is still there, even in the EGFR of uh, 30 to 45. So, um, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll skip through this. It met its endpoint and um, some of its secondary endpoints. So that was um, in diabetic patients. So fine, we've got diabetic kidney disease covered. What about those who aren't diabetic? So next came DAPA CKD. So DAPA goes in, and the reason why we were excited about this one was 68% had type 2 diabetes, but a third of the patients did not have diabetes. And the EGFR range, again, was the area of interest for us as nephrology, right down to 25, with good going levels of proteinuria, you know, AC, ACR 560. So uh, a really important population for us that hasn't been well served for a long time. And same again, very similar chart to the one that you saw for Credence, really early separation and a 39% risk reduction. So a lot of excitement because now we've had a DKD study, but now we've also had a CKD study. Um, forest plot again, lining up to the left. Um, and even when you break it down into uh, subgroups, so diabetics, yes or no, because you could say, well, you got met the primary endpoint because they were all diabetic, but no, um, we met it for the non-diabetics as well. Um, and again, irrespective of ACR and, and, and blood pressure. So really exciting clinical trials that have shown benefit. 
The next question is, well, what about the safety side of it? Because people have raised concerns about amputation and fracture risk, and I think Rosita covered, covered those. But actually, this is a high-risk population. You know, they've got kidney disease. Um, and the good thing about Credence was it showed that there was no difference in amputation, no difference in fractures, a small risk of DKA, and, and, and again, Rosita's covered the mechanism why that might be, but a, a reassuring safety profile. And DAPA was very similar. Um, so again, um, no real difference in amputation, fracture, um, but the nice thing here was also volume depletion, not, not a huge, you know, serious adverse events of volume depletion. As nephrologists, we worry about that, uh, but no, no major differences there either. So reassuring on the safety side. So what about EGFR? And again, Rosita has covered this nicely. We know the mechanism of action on the kidney. So if you're reducing pressure, if we go back to the ACE-ARB studies, if you reduce glomerular pressure, you're going to get a little drop in the GFR initially because you've reduced pressure, so you're reducing filtration. But in the long term, things stabilise out. And what did we see in the trials in uh, Credence and DAPA CKD? Exactly what Rosita showed you for the heart failure trials. They're identical. You get that initial drop, but then things stabilize out. So how's that reflected in the licenses? This is where it's a little bit annoying. Um, they are very different. So CANA, obviously, for diabetic kidney disease only, and they have a threshold on the ACR and, um, and the EGFR. Uh, DAPA, CKD and diabetic kidney disease with no urine ACR threshold, but the license is for 15 and above. So that changes um, the way DAPA closing can be used across a number of indications because you can now use it with, a, with an EGFR over 15. Um, so I think that's relevant to the heart failure uh, people out there as well. Is this reflected in guidelines? Uh, never, always takes forever. Um, so the ADA got there early on their diabetes side, so they uh, introduced uh, the recommendation that these drugs should be used early. Um, we caught up in 2020 after the publication of Credence, so KDGO is our Kidney Diseases Improving Global Outcome Group. Um, so they um, updated and said, get it in early. So at the point of metformin, you should also be on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, so they've recommended that. Nice. So we were all very hopeful about NICE. It was issued on the 25th of August 2021. Two landmark trials. Now is our time. No, uh, they did not put it in. So with di even in diabetics, um, they sat on the fence. They put a statement in saying, NICE are reviewing the evidence on SGLT2 inhibitors in people with CKD and diabetes. Um, so we, we expect them to report back in January, but I, I, they, they're going to say yes, they have to really. We haven't had anything for 20 years. Um, and um, for, for CKD, despite DAPA CKD, they haven't even mentioned it. Um, so we will wait and see what NICE do. But in the absence of guidance from NICE, people have taken things into their own hands. So this is an example from the London Kidney Network where they've talked about three interventions in three months. Um, and as you can see there, month three is adding the SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, as per license. So not much has changed in renal medicine, absolutely ACE and R blood pressure, but the new addition is the use of SGLT2 inhibitors across the board. Um, and um, I'm I've thrown this in a little bit of self-promotion. Um, you know, we've talked about diabetic kidney disease and CKD, but the reality is our, our patients, 80% of these patients have three or more significant comorbidities, diabetes, kidney and cardiac disease. And uh, Phil um, has set up a metabolic renal cardiac clinic at Salford, which tries to address this because a lot of the drugs are the same. And SGLT2 inhibitors, as you've heard, are already being used in heart failure and now in kidney disease, and they've been used for diabetes for a long time. So uh, we're actually looking after patients with cardiac renal metabolic disease, not just CKD. So to summarise, um, progression of CKD in diabetic kidney disease can be attenuated now with simple strategies. Um, guidelines haven't been updated despite two landmark studies, and there is still a significant unmet need, but um, let's see what happens. There are more studies on the way. Emperor Kidney will report out next year. CKD, in my view, is just another indication. Most patients have multimorbidity, and so you can apply other indications um, to use these drugs. And we finally have a new standard of care for chronic kidney disease after 20 years. Thank you. Brilliant. That's a, a great uh, overview, and we'll come back with some Q&As at the end. And um, 
I think just a couple of minor things for myself to add. So from a nice perspective in heart failure, there's a, there's a nice TA for dapper glyphosin and there's an ongoing uh, uh, review for EMPA glyphosin that hopefully will be, be out very, very shortly. Um, it, it, it is really important message there, looking at the RAS, uh, the ACE and ARB data, um, because often in clinical practice, these are called nephrotoxins, of course, the nephroprotective drugs, and that's something that really um, upsets me, certainly, even as a cardiologist. But we'll, co we'll come back to that, so thank you, Spita. Great. Um, we now go to the third uh, presentation, uh, up to the Midlands, to Birmingham, to hear from Dr. Amar Patana. Uh, he's looking after it, this from a diabetes perspective and looking at the GLP-1 uh, agonists in patients with cardiorenal uh, disease. Amma's got a big following on Twitter. He regularly reviews uh, key data from diabetes uh, trials with uh, goggle dots, and uh, he'll be joining us for the present the, the Q and A's at the end. So, uh, welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Amar Patana. I'm a consultant diabetologist in the West Midlands. And today I really want to talk to you about GLP-1 receptor agonists and, and the specifics of when we might consider using them and, and why. These are my disclosures. But really, I don't need to tell you, I'm sure we're aware, diabetes, type 2 diabetes especially, but diabetes in general, costs the NHS a lot in terms of healthcare budget, but also on morbidity to our patients. And as you can see here, 10 billion pounds a year spent on diabetes, with a majority of that on complications of diabetes and specifically those cardiovascular complications which are key to one of the highest uh, causes of, of morbidity and mortality in, in diabetes today. Um, look at that, 530 heart attacks, uh, 680 strokes and of course over 2,000 cases of heart failure. So an important consideration for both our specialties. Just looking at breakdowns within the, the whole cardiovascular disease spectrum, we know type 2 diabetes is associated with an increased risk of all these uh, comorbidities uh, and, and conditions within cardiovascular disease, so stroke, heart attacks, angina, heart failure, all, all associated with higher risks in those with type 2 diabetes. And traditionally, it's always been about risk factor management, hasn't it? Cardiovascular risk factor management, so controlling LDL cholesterol, antihypertensive therapy to reduce the blood pressure, antiplatelet therapy, glycemic control, of course, and weight loss interventions, as well as healthy lifestyle. This all confers reduced risk for subsequent cardiovascular problems. But more recently, we've had these new medications, these newer medications, but I say newer, they've been over about 20, 30 years now, but we've had these medications that have really changed the way both diabetologists and cardiologists and general practitioners actually, we shouldn't forget, manage diabetes. And this all started really in 92 with the GLP-1 receptor agonists. So don't ask me why, but scientists were looking at the spit of a type of poisonous lizard called the Gila monster, as you can see here. And this, this contained a molecule called GLP-1, which is a glucagon-like peptide, which is released by our own bodies and helps the body utilize insulin a bit better, plus has a number of other effects. And they found that this had significant benefits if they could convert it into a, um, an injectable form at that point, which would help bring, bring down blood sugars as well as weight. So you can imagine for someone with type 2 diabetes, a large proportion of people will require both those kind of um, benefits. And these initially were medications like lixicenotide, exenotide, but then we had subsequent development into liraglutide, tulaglutide, and semaglutide, which we have now, which is now available. It's the only one that has an oral form, so a tablet. And it was these multitude of effects that really interested us with these medications. So they worked on the pancreas to help improve beta cell function, improve insulin production, reduce glucagon release, worked on the brain to reduce satiety, uh, so to increase satiety, sorry, and uh, reduce food intake, as well as maybe some effects on cognition potentially. They worked on the gut, which is where the GLP-1 is released. They had effects on the liver as well, and there may be a potential future role for them with the liver. But also, more importantly, from our side, they worked on the heart, and uh, specific heart benefits included reduction in inflammation, potential reduction in plaque formation and aggregation, and increased plaque stability, which is why we think they may have more benefits, not just in terms of glycemic control, but also on the cardiovascular aspects. And this resulted in, in a number of different trials, as we're well, well aware, uh, these cardiovascular outcome trials in type 2 diabetes really changed how we, how we practice medicine in, in this setting. And we've had insulins, we've had DPP-4 inhibitors, we've had SGL2s, as you're well aware, which, which created this kind of interest. <clears throat> and of course, we've had the, the GLP-1s. So all, all these GLP-1 uh, molecules have had dedicated cardiovascular outcome trials. 
And it's these kind of outcome trials that really interested us and in what, what we take forward in managing our patients. So if we look at just any general baseline characteristics across the, the main cardiovascular outcome trials, we've got lixicenotide with elixir, liraglutide with leader, semaglutide with sustain six, and the oral semaglutide with pioneer six, exenotide with excel, albiglutide we don't actually use, we're not able to uh, prescribe in the UK, uh, and dulagotide, of course, with rewind. All these trials looked at a population with type 2 diabetes. But if you look at this next bit, the, the prior evidence of cardiovascular disease, so there's quite a high proportion of the population who had established cardiovascular disease, so a secondary uh, prevention type population. But it's dulagotide at the end, if you look here, with the 31% of patients who had prior cardiovascular disease that uh, was relevant because again, this was a primary prevention population. Apart from that, they generally were fairly similar in terms of the age, gender, and rough HPMC between seven and 8% generally. And as you can see, these are the main positive cardiovascular trials that we see. The others were not positive, but these ones, these, these three and a bit of a kind of were. We've got liraglutide of leader showing benefits, uh, uh, three point MACE, so our time to cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. Um, we've had sustained six with injectable semaglutide also showing benefit and as well as superiority to standard of care with using this GLP-1 molecule. And of course, dulagotide in that primary prevention population is showing, yes, it also, not just in those with high risk or who have established cardiovascular disease, but those who had risk factors, we could reduce the, the, the development of any of those cardiovascular outcomes. This last one here is, is, is oral semaglutide, so that tablet version of the GLP-1. It was a non-inferiority trial and therefore it was successful because it showed non-inferiority. It was not powered to a superiority, so it didn't quite show that benefit, but there is an ongoing trial which should be out in a few years, which will look at that superiority aspect. But again, all these trials show some significant benefits in the cardiovascular output, and especially with stroke. Stroke's one of the key things to find with GLP-1 that that has benefit on. But if we look at this meta-analysis on cardiovascular, sub, cardiovascular disease components with GLP-1s, we see they're fairly sustained. This is the meta-analysis of all the GLP-1 trials, and generally it shows that GLP-1s work in, in reducing cardiovascular death, your composite endpoints of, of heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death, and of course, non-fatal stroke and MIs, which, which again is quite clear with non-fatal stroke, um, the benefits of GLP-1s. There's some evidence towards heart failure. Again, this is possibly related to the, the weight loss and the kind of the effects it may have on, on, on the other sides of things. There's plaque burden, the risk of ischemic heart disease and development, which will then have benefit on heart failure. So that have a slow um, benefit rather than the quick benefits we see with SGLT2 inhibitors. And in fact, there's some benefit, certainly with geoagotide, looking at the renal outcomes, that there's some benefit with prolonged follow-up in terms of the reduce, reduction in, in uh, renal deterioration with the GLP-1s. So again, perhaps not as clear as these cardiovascular benefits, but again, still some benefits to be seen. Now, this has resulted in change in, medical, change in guidelines. We've seen, we've seen the, the, the Europeans and the Americans come together to create this guideline, where after metformin, you will immediately establish whether someone's got atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and then put them on GLP-1 or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And this is generally holds true to the UK, even though the current NICE guidelines are limited with, with regards to that as they're being updated. Of course, the uh, at the time controversial ESC guidelines, which said, don't worry about metformin. If they've got cardiovascular disease um, or at high risk of that, you go straight to a GLP-1 or a SGLT2 inhibitor and then consider metformin afterwards. The most important thing is identifying that cardiovascular risk. Which again, uh, as time progresses, is something that certainly diabetologists are looking at. Uh, I don't think you get us to stop metformin or not stop metformin, but certainly early initiation with GLP-1s and SGLT2s is what we follow. But this is the NICE guideline, just to remind you. So it says, NICE guidelines suggest that GLP-1s are used in triple therapy. So once metformin and two other medications are trialed and it's ineffective, then you could consider GLP-1 therapy. Now, practically, we don't always look at that, but that's something that the NICE suggests. And it's really in those with raised BMI. So if your BMI is over 35, or higher, and you have specific psychological or medical problems associated with obesity, or if your BMI is less than 35, but you can't tolerate on insulin for work reasons, or you have benefits in terms of your other comorbidities, such as sleep apnea, hypertension, um, obesity, those side of things, then you could consider um, a GLP-1 therapy. And really practically, I'd like to say, that's kind of what I think about. When I see someone who I'm treating for type 2 diabetes, what I think about is firstly, what's their BMI? Do they, will they have benefit from weight loss? And if so, do they need some significant weight loss? SGLT2s may help, but GLP-1s have quite good um, uh, data on the reduction in weight loss, you know, looking at four to six kilograms, sometimes more depending on where you start. Um, do they have cardiovascular disease risk factor, or cardiovascular disease or risk factors? That would also kind of push me towards GLP-1 therapy as well. It's insulin and concern. Would they rather have a once weekly injectable rather than a once a day insulin or twice a day insulin? And if it was suitable for them. And of course, GFR, that big thing, one of the main things I look at in my patients, what is your renal function? Because the good thing about GLP-1s is their glycemic benefit is 
sustained up until the GFR 15, whereas medications like metformin, you have to stop at the GFR less than 30. SGL2s, again, the glycemic lowering effects are negligible if the GFR is less than 45. So therefore, gl ones offer that benefit of their effects from a weight loss, from a um, age frequency lowering perspective, even at lower GFRs, up to CKD4. And this is just an algorithm from my colleague, Dr. Kevin Fernando, who uh, works at GP Notebook to create this kind of traffic light system. And it shows across the board, GLP ones, um, certainly the newer ones and the once weekly ones that we use are, are, are fairly stable and utilizable in that, in that range. Last thing to be practical considerations. Well, administration, once daily if it's liraglutide or once weekly, geoglutide or semaglutide are the main ones that we use really these days. I put these websites here because they are great websites. Certainly in this current pandemic, I'm using these uh, websites uh, to kind of direct patients as well for their knowledge. Oral semaglutide is slightly different. Once a day medication, you have to drink it with 120 mils of water, no more, nor less, apparently, according to the guidelines, and uh, 30 minutes prior to any other food or other medication. So you remember first thing in the morning and, and nothing else after, and then at daily compared to the one that's weekly with the others. Mainly about side effects is really GI disturbances are key. You almost will get some evidence of some type of GI disturbance, nausea, vomiting, or loose stools. That tends to settle off about four weeks, and by six weeks is completely clear. So the important thing is patient knowledge, letting them know that they may experience this or they will experience this, but it should settle down if they can tolerate it, and the benefits might be significant. Sometimes I do offer a bit of uh, antiemetics occasionally in the beginning if it's that bad. Hypoglycemia, they don't cause hypoglycemia by themselves, but in a, if they're, someone's already on insulin or sulfonylureas, you may need a 10 to 20% reduction in insulin or halving or even stopping the sulfonylureas depending on the glycemic stability. There's a lot of query about pancreatitis with these medications, but I'm showing all these pictures at the bottom here are all the major cardiovascular outcome trials that show really no significant increase in pancreatitis with these medications. So more and more recently, we're thinking this, this is a low risk, but in someone who has develops pancreatitis or at very high risk of pancreatitis, we may not want to consider these medications or may want to stop them. There's a mention about retinopathy with these medications, which has really been put down to the how good how great they are in terms of HP1C lowering. They can be quite rapid in that HP1C reduction, and therefore that can sometimes cause progression of retinopathy. We see it in pregnancy and also in um, weight loss surgery. So it's important to be aware that people need to have up to date retinal screens, and also we we look at four weekly titrations of the medication to higher strength, which helps reduce that drop in HP1C that's so quick. Weight loss may not be always ideal in some, especially those who are frail elderly, so be aware of that. But apart from that, fairly good medications. And really, the ideal patient for GLP-1 therapy, according to guidelines, is those with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease or at high risk of it, who will be overweight or obese and may have up to CKD stage 4. Key practice points that I would like to remember, and happy to take things further in our case discussions later. Thank you. Perfect. Amar, thank you so much. What, what a great start to the morning. Three superb presentations, all complementing each other, I believe. We're going into Q&A now, and I'm going to hand over to, to Sarah. We will have cases uh, from both the heart failure and the CKD side. So if your question doesn't come up over the next sort of seven or eight minutes, it will probably come up at that time point, and we'll hopefully bring it out in that uh, case. So, so Sarah, we, we've got questions coming in. Can yes, thank you. We've got lots of questions come in. Uh, first of all, from Joshua, IMT3 trainee, and he's asking, will uh, general practitioners and acute medical team be able to initiate SGLT2 inhibitors, or do they need NICE to allow them to authorise uh, the initiation of medication? Is that something you might want to answer? Yeah, thank you. So, um, I mean, my take on it is we're, we're doctors um, and we can uh, practice evidence-based medicine. Um, as you've seen, it's taken two years and I still haven't done anything for, for CKD. Um, so we've been prescribing it um, for pretty much as soon as the, the data came out. So um, absolutely prescribe away. We are able to practice. We're not dependent on NICE, fortunately. Um, so I, I think patients should get the benefit of the drugs. And maybe I can look to Amal, would you have a comment for what's happened? Do you know what's happening in primary care with the sort of diabetic nurses and practices? Are they uh, more increasingly using SGLT2 mm -hmm. inhibitors? Yeah, so definitely, yes. So we, it's over the last five years, we've seen you know, incremental increases in, in the use of SGLT2 inhibitors from a glycemic perspective. Whether it's been fully filtered into the kind of the, the, the cardio-renal side of things where it started for the cardio, you know, the heart failure and the renal aspects, that's what we're working on, that's what we're working on locally as well. Um, but practice nurses, primary care, have, have, have certainly taken to this medication. Um, one of the things, one of the issues at the moment is that the NICE guidelines are currently being updated for type 2 diabetes. And I haven't, we haven't mentioned it here, but if you look at the draft guidelines, SGLT2s are put 
at the same level as metformin. Essentially, it's, it mimics what the ADA and ESD say. In the, and it's mentioned that if you're at high risk of cardiovascular disease or heart failure or, or have established cardiovascular disease, start an initial 2 inhibitor. Um, and that's almost separate to the metformin. So that's even suggesting actually starting it at the same time or within you know, that, that one, two, three, within three months you start it soon. So even the NICE guidelines, as slow as they are, are coming around to SGLT2 inhibitors for initiation. Um, and that's going to be, you know, take up the primary care. And I agree, I think if it's licensed for NICE and, you know, it's available, anybody should be able to use it if they feel confident enough. And that ex extends to uh, acute medicine and, and in inpatient specialties. Perfect. And we hope it's educational events like, like this that uh, helps give people the confidence to do that. So back to you, Sarah. Yeah, another question from um, Catherine Fee, heart failure uh, specialist nurse. Uh, would you consider the introduction of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in severe aortic stenosis? So severe valve disease and HEFREF, uh, Rosita, I'm going to hand that to you as chair. Gosh, thank you. <laughs> Difficult question. I mean, we, we do obviously have those patients. Um, I think we, I mean, they sort of, we have to manage them in context. So we have to look at the blood pressure. We have to look, I know that there's only a small blood pressure lowering effect with SGLT2 inhibitors, but nonetheless, it's it's still there. Um, these patients should be managed as part of, of the, the heart team. So from the, from the HEF-REF perspective, they still should be given guideline-directed medical therapy, but I would just exercise caution. So the, you know, the heart failure, um, the heart failure association advocate this idea of looking at patient groupings and tolerability and phenogroups. So the valve disease patients would just need, would just need extra caution in terms of uh, blood pressure and, and hemodynamic status. But they, they're not, it's not a strict contraindication, but I would say it would be a caution. They're not, yeah, yeah a I, strong I, caution and uh, with multidisciplinary input. That sounds very sensible. Uh, Sarah? Another question from uh, David Lappin, consultant nephrologist. Is there any real-world data yet on beneficial effects of SGLT1 inhibitors, um, renal outcomes in clinical practice? Yes, thank you, David. Uh, good, good friend of the Cardiorenal Forum. Um, so, of course, the licence um, change came in after credence towards the end of 2019 uh, for renal indications for these drugs. And I think that it, it's true to say that the real-world data is currently being accumulated. Um, one of the things, we'd, we'll, we'll plug uh, Smita's uh, MRC clinic from Salford again, the, the multimorbidity clinic. We are, we are definitely collecting data on the outcomes of um, you know, response to these, to, to these drugs. Um, in terms of real world data coming from the United States, I think they'll, they'll be first because they, they changed the license in the States, but it, it, it's really coming through as, as we speak now. And I think we've got some real-world data studies uh, accumulating data in heart failure going going forward as well. Um, any more questions, Sarah? Yes, we've got there, another there one are a minute, few more. Um, do SGLT2 inhibitors have any role on a cellular uh, mechanism of diastolic dysfunction in HEF-PEF? Diastolic dysfunction. So goodness. So, um, I, I, Rosita, I mean, I I think that the sort of you've you've covered the mechanistic uh, yeah, uh, background to this, but. Have you got any comments there from... Is some, it's very still at the level of uh, experimental data. Um, and there's some uh, evidence looking towards the impact of SGLT2 inhibitors in animal models in terms of endothelial function and uh, cardiac inflammation in that way. I don't know if there's a direct... Um, if there is, it will be in experimental studies where they've shown a direct effect on diastolic function. But that's in terms of showing the direct link between the SGLT2 and the diastolic function. But we do have a trial that's been published in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, which was the Emperor Preserve study, which showed uh, that had hard endpoints. So that looked at cardiovascular death and hospitalization. And there was, uh, there was a there was a reduction there. So although it's not, it's not yet translated into the guidelines, there was some benefits, specifically on the hospitalization rather than the mortality. But I'm sure lots of additional data will be published from that study in terms of looking at cardiac function and, and exploring the mechanism of it. So I would say there's probably a signal and it's going in that direction, but no definite data yet. Yeah. So I think that's it. Sorry, Mark. Sorry, sorry. Um, Emperor has the, 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 have done some mechanistic uh, initial looks. So if you look at Emperor CardioLink, is the name of the, the, the study looked at, looking at ventricular remodeling and atrial remodeling, 
have a bit of those. And then there's some evidence that it does have some uh, theotropic effects there. But yeah, nothing nothing significant enough from that. So yeah, but it, that's probably the most evidence so far from my understanding. I mean, I, I guess from a, a practical perspective, it, whilst it's it's really important and of course uh, interesting to understand which of the putative mechanisms having the major impact these drugs work they, they change hard endpoints that, that's the crucial message to to get across and i think with the emper preserve study we've now got a, a data for sglt2 and well and sglt inhibitors across a broad spectrum of patients with heart failure across all ejection fractions up to 60 percent in a, in and out of hospital so it, it's great data so we can have a five minute break, stretch our legs, toilet break, coffee break, whatever you want to do during that five minutes. And we'll see you back at uh, 20 past 11, please. So uh, we're on time. Uh, we'll see you in five minutes.
Great. Well, welcome back. Um, this is the second session. This is uh, on the practical workshops on uh, diabetes drugs. Um, and we're going to start off with, with heart failure. And I welcome uh, Sarah Berkholzer, who we've heard from already this morning. So Sarah's just got some uh, some, some questions and then we'll, we'll bring in, uh, as well as the panellists, um, Smita, Phil, uh, Rosita and Amar. We're also uh, delighted to have uh, the expert... Um, uh, input from Maggie Simpson, who's a nurse specialist at NHS National um, Services in, in, in Scotland. Maggie's also part of the British Society for Heart Failure Board, uh, and I, I will, will give a, a superb uh, overview from a heart failure nurse specialist. So, Sarah, case one. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the workshop, uh, Diabetes Drugs in Heart Failure. I have no disclosures. So I brought you uh, three cases and uh, what we're going to do is discuss each case uh, before we move on. And the first case is a patient with uh, known heart failure, which uh, I saw in clinic. Heart failure was uh, reduced ejection fraction. And you can see uh, he has got a, a CRTD uh, in situ, uh, a mild um, CKD with a um, last EGFR of, of 35. And um, he's on optimal medical therapy and on the sort of pillars of, of heart failure treatment. And um, when I saw him in clinic, uh, the question was, um, should I add uh, dapagliflozin uh, to the treatment? And if yes, how would I, um, how would I discuss that with the patient? Um, and the sort of question to, to the panelist and the uh, group in the, uh, in the audience, um, how would you go about in, in starting dapagliflozin? Super. So thank you, sir. So, so it's a, a fairly common patient that would come across in heart failure services. Um, perhaps, uh, Maggie, can we uh, bring bring you in to to discuss what what would be happening in your practice from a heart failure nurse specialist? What sort of conversations would you have with the patient? So I, I think, so um, I, I think Maggie, there's been a that's struggling to to hear you for some reason. So um, have we got that sorted? So so fine. So not so we'll come back to you in a moment. So uh, Phil, what what when if you were if this had been initiated, would you be expecting people to routinely check the renal function? And if if so, when? So although the guidelines for use of renin angiotensin blockade is that we would check renal function. Uh, it's not It's not the case really with uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. There's no reason to do that. We have confidence that though there might be an initial drop in GFR, um, that that does actually sort of go back towards the baseline value over time. So the answer will be not. Unless the patient is, um, you know, gets an intercurrent illness, then definitely we would. So fine, so uh, intercurrent illness. And, and, the, and the, the, the initial drop in GFR, that's primarily what we're expecting because the afferent arteriole is yeah. becoming vasoconstricted. Because, because of the afferent arterial vasoconstriction and decreased flow into the glomerulus, yes, absolutely. Have we got, have we got Maggie back on yet? We haven't got... OK, we're still struggling, Maggie, so we, we, we will get you um, in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, um, Amar, um, well, we'll come on to, uh, to, to Amar in a moment because I think the next case is, is, would be particularly pertinent for that. So, so I think it's increasingly common. I mean, Sarah, uh, uh, I think something in my own practice, um, we would be uh, advocating to apply sick day rules here. I've not been a total fan of sick day rules for, for all of the drugs that have been out there. The, the data behind them is pretty sparse. Um, but in this situation, if, if patients are coming in for surgery, and they're not going to be eating, or, or if they have diarrhea and vomiting, uh, then I think that's it is is actually the right right thing to be advocating, and we give them warning to to, to keep the private parts clean as well, and keep be vigilant for the slight excess of uh, candida infection. So, um, good. So, um, Rosita, anything to add from your perspective there? Uh, no, I mean that. That's uh, this. This patient is absolutely the patient that fits all the trial criteria from DAPHF and Emperor Reduce. So we have a lot of strong evidence to support 
using an SGLT2 inhibitor in this patient. And uh, my practice is the same as yours. I think for renal function, obviously a baseline assessment to know eligibility. And then for, for our heart failure patients, usually periodically we do check renal function in any case, given the other potentially nephrotoxic drugs that there are. And, and Nephroprotective drugs, drugs, sorry. I, I think you said, didn't you? <laughs> drugs, sorry, <laughs> nephroprotective drugs. Um, so periodically we measure, but I think after starting an SGLT2 inhibitor, at the beginning my practice was to say after a month to check. Um, it's not particularly, uh, um, you know, it's not necessary. It was just to avoid that initial drop. But I would say just the routine surveillance that we normally do in terms of renal function uh, checks and if anything changes. Perfect. Maggie, well, welcome back. We've, we've, we've got technology working north of the border now, I think. So, uh, uh, Maggie, from your perspective, I, I, I think some of what we got, was, was going to ask you has, has been discussed. Do you find patients typically receptive because, you know, I'm doing all, all right, uh, I'm doing all right. You know, why, why do you want to change me drugs, Maggie? Uh, thank you. So, unfortunately, I couldn't hear most of your conversation um, either, so sorry about that. I think the key thing for patients is being honest with them. So, why are we asking them to take an additional medication? It's because of the evidence base. And what is that evidence base? But I think they also appreciate honesty about what the likely side effects are. They're rare, but what are they and what can um, both sides do to, to reduce risk? So, I honestly have not had anyone um, say no to, to initiation of an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, and I think it's just be, being open with them and explaining the benefits to them, which I think we should do across the range of heart failure therapies, because often people just think they're on something just to help their blood pressure a wee bit or keep their heart rate down and don't appreciate the, the real benefits of drugs. So I think just um, being very clear with patients about the potential benefits to them um, definitely helps them be receptive to, to these therapies. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. So, um, Sarah, let's go, I think, for, for time. Let's go on to case two. Yeah, so the second case I brought uh, for you today is a uh, patient who we've recently admitted uh, to our ward with a new diagnosis of heart failure of reduced ejection fraction. And uh, she was an elderly lady who was admitted uh, with pulmonary edema and actually um, respiratory failure as a result of it. And after we've uh, diuresed her initially, we initiated the um, heart failure medication. And uh, the question uh, we have about this case is about when uh, to start up a cliflosin. So this is a patient who's now stabilised on the cardiology ward. Uh, and is, when do you start the medication? Is it early in the, in the acute admission um, or is it prior to discharge? So you're recommending this to the, to the GP maybe? Or um, is it something you would ask the community heart failure nurses to follow up later on when they've been discharged at home? Fine. So um, maybe start with uh, Rosita on this one. So Rosita, in your practice, the, so the patient you know, coming off IV diuretics, uh, getting ready to get them home, some of the uh, prognostically important drugs getting on board, at what stage are you thinking about an SGLT2 inhibitor? I think um, the the evidence we have to draw on for this patient population is from the soloist worsening heart failure trial, and that wasn't dapagliflozin; it was sotagliflozin. Um, but it wasn't. We, if we're thinking that it's a class effect, it was an SGLT2 inhibitor, and, and they they really started when patients were in hospital pre-discharge, but stabilized on oral medication. So really when you're off IV diuretics towards the end of congestion, pre-discharge, and or it could be with the early after discharge. So they had about about 40% or 45% of their patients started just before discharge, and then about 50% of patients that were the rest of them started within two or three days after discharge, and they compared the effects of both of those two. In a that was a diabetic population with acute heart failure, and they, they both have similar effects. So at the moment, the practice is it, it is a good time to start medication in hospital because you can start it, you can educate the patients, you can check the side effects, and it's good to try and get things on board. But I think once they are decongested off intravenous diuretics, start to, starting to stabilize an oral medication pre-discharge or in the very early post-discharge period. Perfect. And, and Maggie, one of our great aspirations um, for when patients go home after a decomposition of heart failure is an early review. So, you know, we try and uh, see patients within, within two weeks. From a heart failure nurse perspective, um, would that be something, do you think, your, your colleagues in, in community or in trust 
that would be comfortable in, in starting an SGLT2 inhibitor soon post-discharge? Yeah, so, yes, I think so. I think that the evidence is certainly there to support it. And I think that when you look at the benefit of these drugs, you know, in DAPA HF, the, the, the patients had greatest benefit were the people who were just hospitalised. We know that it reduces hospitalisations within that month. And I think that particularly at the time period we're in just now, we've got responsibility to treat patients well, but also make every encounter count um, to reduce further hospitalisations and, and service use for the NHS as well. And so I think that ideally, hospital initiation um, would be ideal given the, the low side effects profile for patients, um, especially given the fact that not everyone can meet the two week um, review target just now because of the pressures. And so I think we should do what we can when patients are with us um, and have the therapies initiated to then be followed up and by the specialist heart failure nurses um, once they're discharged. Brilliant. And I'm asked, I mean, certainly that from a, a non-diabetic patient, I think we find the drugs very easy to, to, to use. Um, we, we'll highlight some of the nuances of a more challenging diabetic case, I think, next. But but from if you've got a patient with diabetes who are hospitalised, what are there any particular um, cautions and considerations we should be giving about when we initiate um, an SGLT2 inhibitor for a hospitalised patient? For example, I think I would typically avoid it if they had active infection. Yeah, I think one of the key things with SGLT2 inhibitors is the GU side effects, especially in those with diabetes, with the glucose excretion and the higher risk of infection. But if they're stable, I think one of the main Concerns with SGLT2 inhibitors, especially or potentially in those with diabetes, is uh, DKA, this new glycine with DKA. Actually, in those who don't have diabetes, so from DAPA CKD, nobody had, none of the people on DAPA had had the DKA episodes, and DAPA heart failure was not, I think, one or two, it was not significant. Um, so, really, in those without diabetes, these medications are going to be safer, to be honest. So, in those with diabetes, the, the ones I'd be careful with are really the ones who are. I guess high HbA1c that I'd be concerned with. So if someone's got HbA1c, that's and there's no set number, but generally in the, over in the hundreds or slightly higher in the nineties plus, I'd be a bit careful thinking does this person need insulin rather than an SGLT2 inhibitor. And you could certainly start an SGLT2 inhibitor down the line once you stabilise their blood sugars a bit more. So that's where I'd be kind of getting the diabetes team or the diabetes nurses in, involved to kind of work on that titration of insulin to stabilise things before I initiate an SGLT2 inhibitor. Okay. And those with the high alcohol intake and, and, and this erratic food times and those poor ketogenic diets would be careful because of the risk of ketosis as well. So those are the main concerns I'd have um, with SGLT2 initiation in those groups. Okay, perfect. So third and final case from our perspective, Sarah. So with this case, uh, we're focusing on SGLT2 inhibitors and renal failure. And uh, I brought you this gentleman who's 60 uh, years old. He's had uh, a long uh, history of, of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. His last echo showed an ejection fraction of less than 25%. Um, percent. And he, alongside this, has also got chronic kidney disease with an EGFR of 25. He's a uh, type 2 diabetic on insulin. Uh, his HbA1c is 66 um, and he is, as you can see on the on the right side, on um, more or less op optimal medical therapy. He also has got a primary prevention um, ICD for his ischemic cardiomyopathy, and he's got uh, on board cavidolol, sacubitril, vasartan, spironolactone, and he is not on uh, maximal therapy because he's got some uh, uh, symptoms related to um, hypotension. Um, um, back pain and abdominal pain on exertion. And as you can see, his blood pressure is, is 95 uh, systolic with a heart rate of, of 55, so not much room to, to increase any other medication. He's also on, on insulin in high dose of uh, fruzamide with 200 milligrams a day alongside a statin. Um, and what we would like to focus in this case is um, whether we would start dapagliflozin um, and what the impact on uh, what's the impact on other medications. So would uh, dapagliflozin have an impact on uh, the diabetic medication insulin or uh, the diuretics? Fine. So let's go around the panel. So I think this this was a case that we saw a couple of weeks ago. So he's on middle dose of cubital valsartan, uh, which had been reduced in the last year due to symptomatic uh, hypotension, uh, but 200 milligrams of fruzamide. So um, from an SGLT2 inhibitor pers perspective, Smita, what, what would your thoughts be for, for this case? Yeah, so I think 
Uh, so looking at that, I'd want to know what his urine ACR was, um, <laughs> just because yeah, I'm a nephrologist. Does that, does, that, <laughs> does that mean someone's got to test his wee or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something so. like that, um, because that ties into the CKD licence. But th uh, th putting that to one side, um, his blood pressure is a little bit low. Um, he is on a number of diuretics. He's got CKD. Um, his EGFR is 25. So um, I'd be thinking, actually, I want to introduce this drug because he meets the indication for it. But at the same time, I don't want to make his blood pressure too low because it does have that slight blood pressure lowering effect. Um, so I'd see it as an opportunity to rationalise his medications, perhaps introduce the dapagliflozin. But at the same time, if his heart failure is very stable, consider the uh, reducing the frusamide um, if his um, fluid status was okay and with counselling obviously you know check your weights every day and, and that kind so, of so stuff. this guy's in, in is really struggling actually he's nyha3 he decided around about four years ago um when he had better renal function that he didn't want to pursue transplant assessment we had multiple um discussions um so uh, you know he, he, there's little other options we 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 have available I think uh, Rosita. So when when you look at the, the the data from heart failure and the the mean blood pressure lowering effect is, is small, two to three millimeters of mercury. But it seems to be, it, it, and, and this is my experience as well, that if you've got a lower blood pressure to start with, the impact seems to be less on on blood pressure. Is that your your experience? Yeah, I think. Um, th I mean, there's no specific cutoff. I think some of their entry criteria had a systolic, I think DAPA or Emperor reduced with 95 millimeters of mercury. But a lot of our heart patients have low blood pressure. I think it's more how well it's tolerated if there is a significant postural drop. So I think in this gentleman, if looking at his individual criteria, I was perhaps maybe a little bit less worried about blood pressure, but very much worried about the insulin and the EGFR. So I think I would not be comfortable on the grounds to start it myself without um, discussing it with renal teams with regards to his insulin and his, um, his EGFR. Um, but the blood pressure, he's on the cusp. If he's, if he's always sitting at 95 and he's very well and not having any symptoms of low blood pressure and doesn't have a postural drop, then I think that on its own might would not be an absolute contraindication, he, in my he, opinion. He, he's really miserable with the heart failure symptoms. So, and, and just so I'll quickly come to um, Maggie next. So a, a, a quick, a quick answer, please, because we, we're coming towards the end of time. So 200 milligrams of frusamide, fluid status is pretty good at the moment. I'm going to give him an SGLT2 inhibitor. I've, 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 I've decided that actually I, I have discussed it. We have a, um, a cardiorenal MDT now as well, so it's a good case in, in that. What, would you reduce his frusamide? Um, so I know in the trial there wasn't a big change in diuretic um, dose with SGLT2 inhibitors, but I think in reality, especially in addition to scuprobalsartan, we do sometimes see the need for a reduction in diuretics. Um, so for this patient... I probably would reduce his diuretics, but again, counsel him and arrange very close contact within two or three days just to make sure there was no adverse um, effects of, of reducing his diuretics. That's what we did. So I'm glad we're glad we're singing from the same hymn sheet. So, so brilliant. And Amar, so so this is a, a one. So he, this guy's on, on insulin, and of course, uh, you know, I guess the query comes what to what to do with that. Uh, also noting. That is your GFR drops, the impact on glucose lowering drops too. So what, what would your recommendation be here? So the first thing to mention is that SGLT inhibitor glycemic lowering properties are basically negligible or non-existent once the GFR is less than 45. So adding an, an, an SGLT inhibitor in this setting, I wouldn't be making any changes to the incident as a result of that. Um, but with that GFR dropping, we know that at lower GFRs, insulin stays in the body longer. Its risk of hypoglycemia might be a little higher. So I'd want to look and see, well, I don't have his BMI, so it'd be nice to see that because then I might consider a, a GLP-1 potentially because that GFR is still 25. Um, I might want to consider uh, consider reducing his insulin more from a hypoglycemia avoidance perspective rather than anything else. Um, but uh, being established already on insulin, the only other addition I would say for medic from a glycemic point of view would be a GLP-1 potentially uh, to see if that would mean you need less insulin and lower hypoglycemia risk as a result of that. Just want to make sure everyone's aware that the I'm sure you are the, the evidence based dose for SGLT inhibition in CKD and heart failure is 10 milligrams, um, so 10 milligrams and per 10 milligrams of, 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 of data. Some people are starting five milligrams before, um, but 
but it's ten milligrams is, is no good issues with that. And actually, recent data just last week or two weeks ago showed reduced AKI hospitalization with uh, from DAPA CKD. So we know there's low risks, even though there's a GFR drop, it doesn't translate into uh, AKI and admissions of AKI, which is reassuring. Brilliant. So great. So thank you all. I've been told that I'm I'm going to. Uh, take time off the nephrologist and I'm going to not be allowed to do that. So uh, we've got one minute break now and then we're going to come back with cases from the nephrologist. Thank you so much, everyone, for a great session. Well, great. You'll see that uh, one calra has been replaced by another calra in the, in the chair here. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure to now hear some cases uh, relating to CKD. Um, now, the panel has been extended and it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Austin Chukwu, who's one of our research fellows. He's a, an experienced SPR in renal medicine working with us in Salford. And uh, as well as the, the panel that you know already, we've got um, Amor Patona as well uh, joining us. So uh, over to you, Smita. You're going to uh, take us through three cases um, and I'll be uh, fielding some of the questions with you. But thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Uh, my slides are a bit dry and not as pretty as Sarah's. So I uh, don't know what that says about nephrologists versus cardiologists, but here we go. So case one is Jane. Um, she's a 36-year-old teacher. Um, she was noted to have hypertension and proteinuria during 
the, at the point where she booked in for her first pregnancy. Um, it was complicated by preeclampsia at 34 weeks and, and she was uh, 34 during her pregnancy. Um, so she was referred on to us at Renal. Um, we did a biopsy and we diagnosed her with IgA nephropathy. She's not planning another pregnancy. Um, she's been on labetalol, 100 milligrams BD. Um, she's, um, BMI is absolutely fine. Blood pressure is 138 over 94. EGFR is reduced and she has um, an elevated urine albumin creatinine ratio at 98. Um, so, yeah, that's Jane. So, so thank you, Smita. So, just um, to add one or two bits here. So, for those who are not familiar with um, urine ACR, just uh, th this is in milligrams per millimole. And what I always like to do is remember that um, most of us pass around about ten millimoles of creatinine per day. So it's a, an albumin to creatinine ratio. So if you multiply the figure by 10, that gives you approximately the number of milligrams of albumin you're, you're, you're passing out per day. So here it would be 980, which is, which is a gram. Uh, and the other point is, um, albumin is normally 60 to 70% of most total proteinuria as well. So this patient's probably got a, um, a total um, protein output about 1.5 grams per day. So the first question there is, what target blood pressure should we be aiming for in a patient like this? So um, Austin, do you, do you have a view on this? Oh yeah, um, well, according to NICE guide, guidelines, uh, the target blood pressure should be around less than 130 systolic and less than 80 diastolic uh, blood pressure. And, and because she's, she's got proteinuria, and that, that's more reason why we should try and make, make sure the blood pressure is well controlled. And I'll also be thinking of an ACE inhibitor in this patient to try and manage both the blood pressure and the proteinuria in her. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks very much. Would you uh, have anything to add to that? Or? Um, yeah, that's what NICE says, but uh, it is an area of uh, uh, contro controversy. I love my isn't controversial it? colleague. I've worked <laughs> with her for many years. So. Yeah, I can't help but put my, um, put my foot in it. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's what NICE says, but. Um, KD goes, so our international group, have come up with slightly controversial guidelines, haven't they, recently, yeah. where they are recommending um, a blood pressure of less than 120 systolic. Um, and she's young, she should be able to tolerate that blood pressure. Um, and it's, it's based on data that has shown that lower blood pressures seem to associate with uh, lower progression of kidney disease, particularly in patients with proteinuria. So, um, yeah, I think I'd probably go a little bit lower if she can tolerate it. Um, but again, really important to individualise it. But absolutely, Austin, completely agree. Ace, ARB, um, and you often see this, don't you? Someone yeah. has been pregnant and they remain on libetalol, even though they have no intentions of having another pregnancy and they're missing out on, uh, yeah. on be beneficial medications. And, you know, it's a thing that happens to women, sadly. So on that note, Smita, exactly, that's the second question. You know, would you change the medications and, and why would you do that? Just explain to us. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I'd, I'd switch her over to um, a renoprotective drug, which is a renin-angiotensin system inhibitor. Uh, so um, Ramapril. The, so the data is there for um, Losartan and Herbisartan. They're the two main ones. But we use um, ACE inhibitors, so I'd switch her over um, and remind her not to get pregnant. And, or if she is going to pre get pregnant, to let us know. Um, but I would put her on that, um, and I would also, um, even at this stage, I would put her on an SGLT2 inhibitor because DAPA CKD tells us that she meets criteria, she's got proteinuria, and we know that she's at high risk of progression. And obviously with the cardiac cases, we were talking about the timing of introduction of these drugs. Now, would, would you start those two classes of new drugs at the same time, or would you have a, have a gap there? Yeah, that's a hard one, isn't it? Um, my worry is that when you... Um, when you start a drug, it takes forever to up titrate. Um, so technically, yes, we should get her on a maximal tolerated um, renin-angiotensin system inhibitor dose, make sure her blood pressure is controlled, and then initiate the SGLT2 inhibitor, because that's in keeping what, with what they did in the trial. Um, and so, yes, that's what I would do. But I do wonder whether that just delays things and actually whether we should just get them started at the same time. But trial data suggests you should do it sequentially. OK. And, and What's her prognosis? What do you think there, Austin? You're, you're <clears throat> treating and investigating patients with IG nephropathy and transplantation, so I know we, we're not quite uh, <laughs> at that stage with this lady. But. Well, um, it's, there's no definite way of, of uh, deciding what her prognosis is. I could see that her EGFR is, is actually quite low, and it, it's probably depending on how fast it drops, her prognosis might not be that great. And we, we know IgA is a disease of the third, where a third of them will have just a, 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 
a constant EGFR for a long time, while a third of them will have a gradual decline in their renal function, and then a third of them will just have a rapid decline in their renal function. Um, I think we just have to monitor her and see which of these steps she falls into. And that will probably decide what her prognosis is. And if she gets any additional problems, like an AKI along the line, uh, or if she decides to get pregnant again and develops preeclampsia, then her prognosis might, might actually be worse based on that. No, thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right. The, the delta GFR, so the rate of loss of GFR over time, is, is crucial here. And, and also the response to drugs, because if the ACR actually is smashed by um, renin angiotensin blockade at maximum tolerated dose, um, the likelihood is, uh, you know, she falls into a better prognosis uh, category. However, the GFR is low at 38 to start with. OK, Samita, should we go on to the next case? Okay. OK, so the next one is Aaron. Uh, so Aaron is a 72-year-old retired accountant. Um, he had his MI shortly after he retired at the age of 66. He also has hypercholesterolemia and hypertension, um, which, is, which is tricky to manage. As you can see, he's on a number of um, um, blood pressure medications, so bisoprolol, amlodipine, DOX, and he's also on a low dose of fru uh, he's on a dose of fruzamide as well. Um, he's been unable to tolerate renin-angiotensin system inhibitors because his kidney function declined. Um, he's got uh, a BMI of 34, his blood pressure is still not great, 178 over 88. He's got reduced kidney function, a bit of proteinuria, and he's anemic. OK, so um, should we bring the cardiologist in here? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sarah, um, what, would you be th what would you be thinking about in, in a case like this? Um, you know, intolerant of ACE inhibitors and ARBs with a drop in renal function, very hypertensive. Um, I presume there's a lot of atherosclerosis there, no clues. <laughs> well, I think uh, the big highlight on the right side is, of course, the, the blood pressure that uh, needs to be better controlled. Um, I, I would dig a bit deeper and see what the um, actual decline in the renal function is and whether there's an absolute contraindication to tap into, into, those, uh, into those drugs for sure. Um, and something to... Um, you know, highlight is, of course, the hypercholesteremia that needs to be under control and the anemia that needs to be further investigated. Yeah, so uh, do you want to talk about anemia there, Austin, in this case? Oh, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, well, he, she, uh, he's a gentleman that is in his 70s. Um, he's an anterior path uh, and, and he's got CKD. So he is prone to anemia of chronic uh, kidney disease. And because anemia is always a risk multiplier in these patients, he, uh, but also it's something that is reversible. It will be worthwhile trying to manage that anemia. But I also think about renal artery stenosis in this gentleman with, with uh, being an arterial path and, and not being able to tolerate ACE and ARBs. I will try and, and, and look for any possible renal artery stenosis. Okay, and how would you go about doing that? Well, we'll start with basic imaging and see whether his kidneys have, have got differences in size, whether one is smaller than the other. And then we can go and, and uh, do a lot more in-depth imaging with MRI of the renal vessels to see if there is okay. And would you be worried about uh, contrast at this level of GFR? Well, uh, yes, definitely. I'd be worried about con uh, contra adding contrast. But um, in MRI with the gadolinium, um, I'm not sure it would be a huge risk in this. No, no, not, uh, not above a GFR of 30 would be uh, the way we play it, really. So everyone knows about nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which, you know, um, in fact, it, it's a condition that is rarely seen now, but there was a phase where there were about 500 worldwide cases, weren't there, um, in around 2006 to 2011 until guidelines changed. Um, what about um, contrast with CT, renal angiography? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I did contrast would be a problem, uh, would be a risk, uh, especially because um, he's got his kidney heart disease. He's probably got a poor LV function. And, and yeah, OK. And what about anemia management here, Smita? Well, we, we've shown the haemoglobin. We obviously need some other tests, don't we, as well? We do indeed. So we want to really understand what his haematinics are doing, and particularly his iron indices, um, because as Austin has said, we have therapy. So if he is TSAT is less than 20%, so transferrin saturation is less than 20%, um, then we're probably going to want to top him up. And because he's got CKD and because we're nephrologists, it's quite easy to just give him some IV iron, and it's more effective, it's better tolerated, and we have ready access to it. So we'd want to give him some IV iron to top him up. Um, that in itself will probably lift his haemoglobin up to over 100, and, and that's going to be good from a cardiologist cardiovascular point of view isn't it with his MI um, and um, and but if it doesn't then the next stop would be to give him some EPO. 
yeah. being mindful of that blood yeah. pressure, though. That's right. So, so one thing that we're not biting into is how... Let's just assume that he, this patient doesn't have renal artery stenosis, OK? Um, how are we going to get his blood pressure down? Paul? Yeah, I mean, I, from a cardiac perspective, I'd be keen to know what his LV function looked like, but I'd be also irrespective of that, I mean, uh, be contemplating an MRA um, here. So, so certainly if he's got uh, an ejection fraction less than 40%, we've got convincing data to su support that. There's ongoing studies looking at uh, MRAs at, at higher rejection fractions as, as, as well um, with both spironolactone. It's always spironolactone. Um, so, but I, we, we found no, it very good, good, good. I've got good. to say in renal medicine, I mean, there is a there is a slight reluctance actually to use MRAs. I've got, got to say, maybe we should change. Um, I think the, f the first move many of us would do would, would be to double the dose of doxazosin there from 8 to 16, probably. Uh, we've got maximum dose um, bisoprolol and amlodipine. Um, I, I would maybe just, I might um, try um, introducing a low dose of, Herbisot and back in actually at some point I've got to say uh, after we've done the you know the the renal artery imaging, uh, but but yeah no I mean it's a good point I mean the I know that MRA usage in um, in resistant hypertension clinics um, yep. you know it, they are used um, yeah I mean the other, the other thing if he had impaired LV function would be to uh, to be thinking about hydralazine as well from the the data we've got from the old uh, studies with isosorb by dinitrate and hydralazine been better than placebo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Smita, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors with this patient? Yeah, I, I mean, he, he's an example of that multi-morbid patient, isn't he? So depending on his ejection fraction, he might meet criteria for initiation from a heart failure point of view. He certainly meets criteria from a renal point of view, from a CKD licence. Um, so the ACR and the GFR uh, allow him to do that. So um, it w it's a potential option, isn't it? Just it might just tick the blood pressure down, probably not much. Um, but um, it will at least provide him with some protection from the complication side of things. But yeah, the blood pressure is the priority here. Um, uh, should we go on to the third case, Peter? Mm -hmm. Right, so this is Peter, 67-year-old um, pub landlord, um, diabetic for over 20 years. Um, he's also got retinopathy and, um, as most diabetics, also has a bit of hypertension and CKD. Um, so he was started on Ramapril, 1.25 milligrams, my personal bugbear. Um, and, but when they did try and increase it, he developed hyperkalemia. He's on metformin, he's on glyclozide, linagliptin, amlodipine and allopurin, also a bit of a metabolic profile. Um, Oh, BMI's gone. But, well, his BMI was 42. Um, his HbA1c is elevated at 78. Blood pressure, 142.90. EGFR, 50. ACR, 238 milligrams per millimole. No, thank you. So, uh, Amar, you've been waiting uh, patiently uh, to, to contribute. So, um, the questions there, the, the first two, actually. What target blood pressure would you aim for? And then, how would you manage his diabetes in this case? Yeah, no, so um, I can't remember, the, I mean, so with, with anyone who's got complications from diabetes and obviously evidence of, of renal disease, we're certainly looking at 130 over 80 as, as, a, as a minimum, really, with regards to his blood pressure. Um, that's what the guidance says, lower depending on the person. But I, I, I'm interested to hear what our colleagues say, but I want to go a bit lower than that, to be honest, even though that's the, that's the recommendation. Um, focusing a bit on, on two things I've noticed, obviously, is, is the urine ACR and his uh, HbA1c, the key things. Um, it was just 78, so certainly an SGLT2 inhibitor would be reasonable in this, from this setting. And I actually prioritize um, SGLT2 inhibitors in anyone with diabetes who's got either heart failure reduced ejection fraction or um, uh, a raised urine ACR. And because of how significant his is, um, it made perfect sense to start that. Um, the fact he's on glyclozide and uh, would make me want to be a bit, bit, um, a bit concerned about the risk of hypoglycemia. His GFR was at 50, I, I can't remember, what was that? Yeah, so, so there's still some glycemic glowing properties with, with the GSGL2s in that setting. So I would probably want to aim to reduce, if not ideally, to the stopping the glycoside. Um, I think he'd be someone whose BMI was that 42, did you mention, or was that something else? I... Yes. Yes, yeah, so, so a GLP-1 in this setting would be would also be an, an, an adult, I'd want to be starting that fairly, fairly soon, actually, with him as well. Um, not from a renal perspective, but really from a BMI and glycemic lowering perspective, I, I believe that would have more benefit um, 
to to him uh, from, a, from a weight lowering and a glycemic point of view than, than even the SGLT2, to be honest. And so I'd be keen on, on those two medications. Probably the SGLT2 first, um, and would be very keen to start that fairly, fairly soon after. So, Anwar, can I just ask a question um, that came out of the Credence study, really? So, in Credence, canagliflozin was used at 100 milligrams a day. Um, here, we might want um, a greater amount of HbA1c improvement, but, you know, glycemic improvement. Um, would, would you actually make any comments about the use of 300 milligrams, which is, I think, the top dose versus 100 milligrams? When, when, when would you switch to 300, for example? So, because that GFR, so, so once it's over 600, um, the GFR, so over, six, over 60, sorry, the GFR, then um, 300 milligrams of canagliflozin is, is, is the license for glycemic lowering. Once it's less than th uh, 60, between 60 and 45, it's the 100 milligram dose, which is also the renal license dose. So, from, uh, the 300 milligram has shown some benefits in terms of greater HMC reduction, especially with canagliflozin showing probably out of all the old the twos. From that analysis, uh, network analysis um, that it had the highest agency lowering, but with this gentleman, I it wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be keeping it at hundred. Um, and that would in the ten milligram dose is is the standard dose across either a spectrum. Okay, that answers your question. No, thank you. So, and and just another point to pick up on, and that is that. We're, we're far from optimised in terms of the renin angiotensin blockade here. Ramipril, one point two five milligrams. As you as you say, Smeter, it's a, yeah, it's a bugbear of mine as well. You know, it's a, a, a whiff in the wind, isn't it really? So, what would you like to say about that? You know, the hyperkalemia is preventing optimal use of renin angiotensin blockade. So. Yeah, absolutely. And and so many patients get stuck on Ramipril 1.25. So there are, you know, I think we need to look into the hyperkalemia, make sure that we've covered things like acidosis, he's diabetic, um, make sure we've looked at his diet. Um, and once you've corrected all those things, you can usually up titrate the Ramipril. Um, and if even at that point, if you get stuck, we do have potassium binders now. Um, so again, with appropriate counselling and discussion, because there is that you're treating um, a complication with another tablet or sorry or, or another medication um, it's important to have the, that discussion with the patient as to why you're doing that but if it enables him to get up to a, a good dose that's going to be he's only 67 um, so I think it is worth having those conversations. No thank you very much so great workshop a short one but um, you know getting into some really important um, areas really and uh, of course kidneys are extremely important. So thanks everyone. We, we've got a five minute break coming up, uh, following which we are going into some more sessions. Okay, so, um, so see you shortly. Thank you. <laughs>